The first speaker is Dr. Tony Reshi. Now, Tony Reshi is president of Save Our Suburbs, and that's an organization uh, concerned about the impact of population growth on the suburbs of major cities in Australia. Tony issued a media release on the 30th of September uh, announcing the formation of the Save Our State political party. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Tony Reshi, please. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction and for the invitation to speak at this gathering this evening. Now, my angle on the topic of populate or perish is the impacts of increasing population on our cities. To try to see exactly uh, what the effects are of an increasing population. And my presentation will basically consist of um, discussing the actual policy that's been chosen by the New South Wales and other state governments to house the increasing population, the results on our quality of life, and also I'd like to mention some possible alternatives um, to the current policies. Now, of the G20 nations, uh, the uh, Australia being one of them, Australia is projected to have the second highest population increase by 2050. As you can see, our population is projected to increase by 65% in that period. And the second only of these G20 nations to that of Saudi Arabia, which is 74%. So obviously, plans have to be made to house this increasing population. Now Australia is blessed with a sunny climate, and Australians have, in the past, enjoyed a relatively free, um, open-air lifestyle. Mostly in single residential houses, surrounded by gardens, in which people can uh, um, have recreation and uh, have various activities like gardening and growing fruit and vegetables. Surrounded by greenery and plenty of wildlife. But to house an increasing population, the state government of New South Wales has decided that this type of life has got to be abandoned and we will instead be increasing density within the, our existing communities. And communities have been told they must all take their share of an increasing population, um, namely a high-rise being erected within their communities. Now, I well remember that house that's been replaced by high density. That's Sydney Harbour, as we see it now. But you go up along the harbour, you'll see this type of thing encroaching upon the shores. That has been turned into that. That's gone, and that's been replaced by that. High density is inexorably advancing onto our single residential way of life. Now, in a place like Hong Kong, where there's a shortage of land, and uh, a very large number of people, there is no option but to put people, house people, in little boxes up in the sky. In uh, China, most new constructions now are high density. Of course, China has got a very large population. In East Germany and uh, other Eastern European and other communist regimes, they tended to put people into high density. More in East Germany, 
Uh, no, sorry, that's Chesswood. <laughs> Strathfield. Auburn. Burstville. Well, how does the Department of Planning force this type of living onto our communities? What has been done is that the Minister of Planning has promulgated a regulation called State Environmental Planning Policy 53, which says that every local authority, every council, has got to submit to the department a residential strategy for increasing uh, density in their communities. Otherwise, the state government will take away that council's planning powers. So, councils inevitably have to submit a residential strategy which goes to the Department of Planning and uh, the Department then gives this strategy to what was called the Minister's Residential Strategy Advisory Committee and that consists of officials and developers and I might say that these developers stand to profit from the subsequent constructions that will be built in a particular area, which as far as I can see, is a blatant conflict of interest. Eventually the Department of Planning, after much to and throwing, accepts the residential strategy, which then goes on to public exhibition. But this is purely tokenist, because of whatever the public say is almost completely ignored and uh, the residential strategy is put into effect. Recently, some further legislation has been passed to allow the state government to compulsorily acquire property which can be handed over to developers for high-density development. And so people are in danger of losing their homes. Now, the state government gives various, alleges various benefits for uh, their policy and uh, one uh, benefit they claim is housing choice. If more high density is put amongst our communities, they say there will be more housing choice. But research shows that from 15 to 20 percent of Australians only live in high density the rest want to live in low density. And what's more, of those living in high density, about half would prefer to live in single residential if they had the opportunity to do so. This bit of research asked people whether they, people in those particular areas, would actually like to live in that area. And you can see that uh, rural residents 90% would like to live in rural areas. Small town residents, 76%. City suburb dwellers, 75%. And central city dwellers, 64%. So you can see that as density increases, people are less likely to want to live in that particular area. Now, Professor Robert Cummings, Australian Unity Wellbeing Index, states that the happiest electorates tend to have a lower population density. If one uh, looks at various factors over a period of time, could I have this? Pointer, please. One can see that from 1970, Okay, you can see from 1970, the actual cost of construction of dwellings has more or less stayed constant. But the actual prices of houses has escalated enormously. And that has occurred since the onset of the application of high density policies. <coughs> And the reason is that to force their policies onto the community, the state government has restricted the release of uh, greenfield sites. 
And with an increasing population, for example, in Sydney of over 50,000 a year, if they don't release more sites, um, half sites become scarce. And uh, as far as I know the economics, scarcity results in high prices. A land component and the cost of a house or a unit has increased from 30% to 70% in that period. What's more, it costs twice as much to build a unit per square metre as it does to build a house. Now, I think we all are fully aware that Sydney is suffering an extreme housing affordability crisis. A recent survey of various countries showed that second only to Vancouver, Sydney has the highest house prices in all the countries studied. It takes 9.1 years of median family income to purchase a median house in Sydney. And that means that for most people, 50% of family income has to be spent on just servicing a mortgage. People are now saying that their children will never be able to afford to purchase a house in Sydney. So there's a real housing affordability crisis as a result of these high density policies. This young man is saying it's a horrible, horrible thing to be homeless at a young age. <clears throat> and in New South Wales there are about 11,000 people who are homeless. Research shows that units are not really the ideal environment in which to bring up children. There's lack of safe play space and children are forced to be quiet and uh, they tend to have various difficulties when they finally go to school. Identity has been shown to be very bad for mental health. This huge study of over 4 million people shows that the rates of psychosis were 70% greater in the denser areas, and there's a 16% yes, a risk of developing depression. Now the authorities claim that they save money by putting more people into existing areas because they have better use of infrastructure. But what we see is that you put more people into the area and it overloads infrastructure. Traffic congestion increases. Because although a great percentage of people in high density will tend to use public transport, that's completely overwhelmed by the large number of people in the area who have to use their cars for all sorts of reasons. And that traffic congestion results in uh, pollutants being put into the air, more pollutants. In fact, you can see that as density increases, so does the air pollution classification. And this has serious effects because the World Health Organization calculates that three times as many people die from air pollution, from cars, as they do from uh, traffic accidents. We know that our state rail services are now finding it extremely difficult to cope with the increased demand. So do our buses. Now, these children are walking past toilet paper and worse because the sewerage system has been overloaded by the increased number of people in that area. One must realise that the original infrastructure in our suburbs um, was designed for the original density in the village. You had more people and you just got to overload it. And it's extremely costly to augment um, 
infrastructure by digging up roads that often crisscross by undocumented cables and pipes. You have to interface with outdated technology. And there's, of course, damage to existing services. The assumption of saving um, just doesn't take into account the costs of upgrades and retrofits. And I suggest that if population is to increase, new infrastructure is a cheaper and environmentally better option than retrofitting. And Greenfield's development provides efficient, cost-effective mass production. Now perhaps the claim that trumps all claims from the high-density advocates is that uh, high density is environmentally sustainable. It's claimed that it's more environmentally friendly to have high density than to have low density. Now this study by the Australian Conservation Foundation has calculated the greenhouse gas emissions per person per year and they've done that per postcode. And we see, for example, that in a high density area like North Sydney, the emissions per person are just under 31 tonnes per year. All right, let's compare that with, say, a low density area like Liverpool. You see the emissions there per person are just a bit over 17 tonnes per year, about half what they are in the high density area. It's completely contrary to what we've been told. And this is uh, the case over all our capital cities, where if you look at the high density core areas, the emissions are about 28 tonnes per person <coughs> per year. And in the core, uh, in the outer areas, the average is 17.5 tonnes. Now they are really um, understandable explanations for this, which I won't go through now, but we just perhaps look at one, which is the energy consumption, that's the electricity and the gas, household gas, um, in dwellings, which by the way is quite considerable, it's double the energy of uh, transport that people use. We see that in high rise, the energy used is much more per person than in detached housing. And the reason is because the various services in the high rise, um, the lifts, the lighting of common areas, the air conditioning, clothes dryers. Also, the embodied energy in the structures themselves is, according to my calculation, about five times of for high rise compared to single residential. And then if you think of the future, where we want to use sustainable energy as much as possible to collect solar energy and to collect rainwater, it's obvious that the greater the roof area per person, the more effective these endeavours will be. People are concerned about cities encroaching on land. They say Australia is short of land, and really, we should contain the size of our cities. But if you have an increasing population, it's just a what the effect will be. If you take Sydney as it is now, which is about 45 by 45 kilometers, and you were to double the density in the residential areas, and these are about 40% of the area of the city, you'll see that you only save about five kilometers on the periphery. So you double the density and then you say five kilometres. Now that is absolutely negligible when you consider that only 0.3% of Australia's surface is urbanised. So that really the, the uh, stipulation that we would say in land is really no excuse for putting us all in units like chooks in battery cages. Well, what are the alternatives? Let's look at some of the situation that's occurred in the United States, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Atlanta. 
Now back in 1981, the population of those cities were comparable to that of Sydney and Melbourne. And uh, now they've considerably exceeded that of Sydney and Melbourne. The populations are much more. But they haven't instituted high density policies, they just allowed their cities to expand. And if you look at the bottom graph, you can see that in that period, the housing costs have remained constant at about three years of family income to buy a house. Whereas, as we know, for Sydney and Melbourne, they've gone through the roof. And then in spite of the fact uh, that they are more spread out, the journey to work in Dallas, Fort Worth and Atlanta are 25 minutes and 29 minutes respectively, that's the average. Whereas in Sydney, it's 35 minutes. And the reason is, of course, because of the increased congestion. Also, we must realise that cities are decentralising and not everybody travels to the core every day. So there are alternatives to high density. And uh, we suggest that there should be a viable decentralisation policy. And fortunately, we're hearing more and more about that now uh, because of the current state of the federal government, where independents from the rural areas now are likely to have a balance of power. And now everybody is suddenly talking about, uh, about uh, boosting um, the economies of the rural areas. So it's really amazing what the ballot box can do. We also suggest the creation of satellite cities and with various features that I won't go into now because we don't have time. It should of course be judicious, judicious expansion of capital cities and higher densities for those areas that prefer that. As I maintain that really uh, to force high density onto people who design their whole lives onto another state of, of living is really impinging on their human rights. So in this part of this discussion on population and parish, what I've looked at is the policies that have been chosen to cope with an increasing population, the result on our quality of life, and suggestion that there are indeed alternatives.